what this show anyway the broadcast is now starting all attendees are in listen only mode hello gang hello 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 I feel like hey, everybody <laughs> oh how art thou everyone how's Alicia how and how's Jennifer Let's share our common drink tonight here, Alicia. <laughs> what you got? Yeah, all right. Water and a big drop. That's my background. <laughs> yeah, I, I got my backup with my water. But uh, now I got to tell you guys, though, this makes me burp. So I'm trying to be very careful and not burp. Oh, you missed a good one. I didn't hit the live for the live stream, people. We're all drinking Canada Dry here. So, uh, <laughs> I live stream. Sorry about that. I think one, everything one, should be working out. One day I had that one that we have, you know, those great big giant heavy glass mugs. I think of them as root beer mugs, but they kind of, I guess, would look like beer mugs. But I had Canada Dry in there and I was just a drinking away on one of our webinars. And, and I thought, you know what, in the camera, that kind of looks like beer, but it's not. But they'll be thinking I'm a drunk. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably mm -hmm. how people would look at it. You're right. Well, for those of us who are joining us for the first time, put a one in the chat if you can hear and see us. That would be great. So I can make sure that we are good to go. Thank you, Patricia and Nina yeah. and Lori and Marie and Stacy. It looks like lots of people are here. So welcome to the January 2, 2020. It's a new decade. We get Woo! to stay in the CCO. Yeah, right. Yeah, and Welcome. we weren't we didn't do December, so we missed you guys. It's been a long yeah. time, yeah. <laughs> so welcome to the January 2020 Certification Coaching QA webinar here with Jennifer Saunders and Alicia Scott from the CCO team, myself, Boyd Stazuski, your webinar host. <laughs> and if this is your first time, we're gonna hear from you in a second or so, but we thank you for being here today. Next slide, please, ma'am. And we have still people coming in, so that's a good time. And if you've heard this before, we ask you to be patient while I go through it for all the newbies that are out there. And if mm -hmm. this is your first time here, welcome, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. We love you for being a, uh, here on a Thursday evening uh, once a month. So this is a general webinar about all things medical business certification, medical coding, billing, and practice management related. Have I left out anything or is this still the same pretty much? I think it's still the same. We try to, yeah. we, yeah, we try to cover a lot. I think uh -huh. we have some new, we have some new credentials that seems to always keep cropping up, like in Jennifer's case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell them. Do a little adding this week in the slide deck. So yeah. here is the first question: How many CCO webinars have you attended? Um, should I hit that one, Alicia? What do you think? Why don't you go ahead? I'm scared to now. Yeah, I hear you. Everybody okay. knows so my let internet me isn't best. Find my surveys if I can find where my surveys are. Polls, there they are. I, I can probably Got it. It. there you go. So okay. is this your first time? Woot woot. One <laughs> back for more. Woot, woot. Two to five, repeat <laughs> offender, five to ten, liking it here at CCO, or are you a frequent flyer with ten plus and you just leave lose count after a while, like me? <laughs> Vicky says it's her first. Yay. In the background, I'm looking at my uncompleted spaghetti dinner, and I'm kind of missing Joanne right now and talking about Italian food. Oh, that's <laughs> she's, right. She's a, great, she's a great coder who cooks very well, I understand, and from scratch yeah. for her Italian yeah, food. Yeah, okay. her Italian. So thank you for voting. I'm going to close the poll here, and I'm going to share that poll. Let's see who's here. First time, 30% almost, 29%. Wow. One. Back for more, 11%, repeat offender, 18%, liking here, CCO, 8%, and frequent flyers, 34%. So frequent flyers are the winners tonight, followed by the first timers. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Yay. Yeah, that's okay, a good mix moving there. The slides. Yeah, that is. So we try not to leave out things for those of us who are new to our webinars and such. This is our topics for tonight, and we're gonna go through a short introduction to let you know about our graduates and what's going on with CCO. And then we've got these prepared questions that Jennifer and Alicia have been working on. So Jennifer, what you got? I have um, coding a fascectomy, so spinal coding, um, the hick picks use, how 
what's best to use the HICPIX book and the difference between some behavioral and psychological coding assessment codes. So. Nice. Lisa. Yes, and I'm going to do advanced care planning, coding for that, uh, coding robotic surgery the reality of remote coding and we're going to talk about some infusions 96368 and 96366 for example and felicia's camera so seems to be a little Jennifer bit delayed it's her internet so she's driving the slide deck so <laughs> as long as you can hear and okay. see the slide deck we're good but you're okay you're okay you're just a little sometimes okay I'll turn it off and on and see if that doesn't yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll turn it off and on and see if that helps. Okay. Oh, I can switch Moving right along. Go ahead. You can do this one, yeah. Alicia. Well, you know, every month we have this Q&A webinar and the we try to keep it um, to 90 minutes. We do really well. We're pretty good at that now. We have the questions prepared that our club members have submitted. Uh, we do a drawing for prizes, so stay tuned. If you stay to the end, you can get a prize. And then if you submit some questions in the chat, we'll put those at the end of the webinar after we've more or less officially gotten done with the webinar. The webinar, and you can stay like behind the scenes, and we'll answer some of those questions. So, uh, if you have a topic request you would like us to do some research on, go to cco.us forward slash topic hyphen request, and you could see yours up here, or you might see it on our club webinars. You just might. Mm -hmm. Yay. You if they're pretty might. lengthy. Oh, and here I am just waiting for the slide to change and not moving it myself. Okay, again, <laughs> stay to the end because I was just reviewing one of our previous webinars and I think on that one, like three names got pulled and they they didn't stay to the end and the, and the fourth person won. A uh, few things that you can pick from. We have a blitz package that you can get if you're wanting to sit for one of the exams. Uh, you can have a phone hour session with one of us, or you can get a year of the CCO Club Basic, which is fabulous. We'll answer more questions about those later too. If you need CEUs, great place, go to the club. This is how you can find out more. Go to uh, cco.us forward slash club. Uh, every time we do a webinar, we have it transcribed and <clears throat> excuse me, it goes in the club and it allows you to uh, print off the slide deck, make notes, ask questions. It's a lot of fun. You may have to take the next slide, Boyd. I feel like I swallowed some. Oh, it's a poll anyway. <laughs> so well, I did the wrong one. What is your status in a medical coding, billing, or similar medical business related job? Let's find that poll and launch that guy. Are you looking at medical coding as a career? Or are you certified and looking for a job? Are you employed or are you are you trying to improve your current job situation and earn a new credential, a popular one? And no, not pursuing employment at this time. Hopefully we covered everybody. If we didn't, let us know in the chat there in your questions box. By and doing this, it, it helps us get a feel for the, the topics and the questions that are going to be most suited to you. So that's why we ask these. We want to make sure what we offer you is beneficial. Good point. Hey, JJ's and here from the Philippines. <laughs> got 81% voted, so let's share our results. Go ahead and read that, uh, Jennifer. Well, we have 19% looking at medical coding as their career. 15% uh, are certified and looking for a job. 38% are employed. We have 27% looking to improve their current job situation, earn a new credential, which is wonderful. And we have 1% who is not pursuing any employment at this time. So it's very mm. great to see that many employed people in a little amount looking for a job. So yep. exciting. Absolutely. Great. There's a so lot now of graduates. graduates. Woohoo!
if you've graduated recently, uh, even if it wasn't one of our courses, we'd love for you to let us know so we can encourage you. Uh, but what we're going to do is talk about the people who have let us know that they used our products. Uh, Jennifer, I think you should go first since <laughs> I'm still recovering from swallowing. <laughs> Something. <laughs> So these are our CPC exam passers, and these are from November and December. Manisha, Christina, Melissa, and LaToya all used a combination of the BAT system and practice exams. Kimberly Ellis, uh, Carla, Damaris, Cynthia, Rochelle Riley, and Brenda Kep Kepferl, they all past the CPC using the BAT technique and some of the other great products. Oh, it took our courses too. We have still some more CPCs uh, from November and December. Julia Devino, Jessica Carpentier, um, Gina Manning, and Hao Nguyen um, all used uh, BAT and blitzes. Mm -hmm. Course, Cool. Darlene Palmer. Mary Downs, Tammy, uh, E.H. it says, and Sean Hill, again, we're still in the CPCs, how exciting. Looks like they all use the BAT technique and some of them took the courses that we offer. That's exciting. And still CPCs, we have um, Tamara Ford, Rana Olsenwich, and Katura Duvall, who looks like they just passed. That's great to hear. Still using that bat technique in ICD tens. So, I uh, Rana or I'm not sure if her name is Rana or Rona, but she really asked some great questions in the club. So that's that's good. Kathy V got her CPMA, and so did Nora A and Marija Gobov. I have no idea. Jennifer, help me on that last name. Vakulia. V U K E. Vakulia. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds good. They all got the auditing CPMA. They use the they use the bat technique. Uh, our CPMA blitz that we have looks like um, uh, also the practice exams. And Ashton Lane got the CRC, great credential, using our course and our CRC blitz. Thank you, Ashton, for mm -hmm. letting us know. Oh, we, we have, have some first letters. They didn't want to. Yeah. Sometimes they Tamika. don't want us to tell their full name, and that's fun. <laughs> Tamika, and then we have some other people who passed her COC, um, another COC, CRC, and the PCO for T, Lee, and A. <laughs> Compliance. Uh, Brenda Dem Dumleo, I just think they listen, they like to hear me torture their name. Got the CCC, which is the cardiology credential. Mm -hmm. And um, Sarah Otto got, and also Erica Voigt got the uh, billing credential through mm -hmm. the AAPC CPB. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That was a lot. A but then lot we weren't here December, right? Right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's probably why. Yeah. So this officially launches our program. <laughs> I guess I don't really call it a program, do we? You know, now we're going to get into the juicy stuff, the education, the, what you've been waiting for. And Jennifer gets to go first. I'm going to turn my camera okay. off real quick. And all right. So we had a question come in. Yeah, recently that somebody was struggling with coding an ORIF, which is an open reduction internal fixation. So it's usually abbreviated ORIF. Um, most recently, it was a fascectomy of a C6, C7, and they'd appreciate any help or resources we can give. So in dealing with um, C6, C7, of course, you're dealing with the spine. And spine is one of um, uh, one of the most difficult things next to, I'm sure, cardiology and some of the other. But spine can be very difficult because one thing, you can get codes from two different sections for the spine. You can get them out of the 20,000 muscular sec section and 60,000 neurological. So it gets very confusing as to what we're doing on the spinal codes. 
And then, of course, the doctors, their abbreviation, they're going to use um, levels or disks or talk about segments or interspaces, and it gets a little confusing as well. Um, so first, we look at, of course, we have the spinal column or vertebra, and it's divided into the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx. So cervical C1 through C7, thoracics T1 through T12, lumbars L1 through L5. Sacral is S1 through S5, which actually when you're born, they are individual. And then as you grow um, older, they fuse together. And then the coccyx. So in and we have uh, put some pictures in here. Mine aren't gory like Alicia's, but um, so just looking, now we're looking from top down. So you're seeing an above a spinal column looking down. So the yellow part there, of course, is your spinal cord. So everything's going to encompass around the spinal cord, keeping it safe. Um, so we have anterior and posterior. So um, that's very important when it gets to spinal coding. And then you can see the facets as well. Now, if you ever do any pain management, anesthesia, uh, orthopedics, neurology, they do talk about facet injections. So that's something different as well. We need to keep in mind those facets and how they all work. And then have it down a little bit more. So, the spinal cord, of course, goes through each vertebra, and then it will branch out in between each vertebrae. So that's where all your nerves will come out. So each vertebra has four processes. They have an upper and a lower, and that makes up that facet joint. So I'm going to have another picture as well. But we have a segment, and they would, you know, a doctor would describe that as C3 or L4 or something. That's the segment. So that is that single vertebral bone, that single one, and then there's an inner space, they would label that. So if you're looking through documentation, you're looking for C3, C4, L1 to L2, something like that. That's the inner space. That's non-bony. That's that gelatinous mush in between each of the discs that cushions them, and that's what keeps the nerves from irradiating. So when people have back pain, it typically is because those that cushion is gone and those two discs are pushing on each other now and hitting that nerve. So it depends on which nerve they're hitting, where on your body you're going to have pain. So um, I have another picture to show that a little bit more. So we have each of the discs and you can see the space in between that intervertebral disc. It's a little gray space in between each of those discs. So that's what we're, that's that cushioning in between there. So as each of those um, facets can come out and they connect. So it's very, um, it can be very difficult now. We need to look at, we have the anterior and the posterior. That depends on the type of surgery that's going to be done. So when we get into some of these surgical procedures, we can go down a little bit more. So we need to keep a couple things in mind when you're looking at this, um, when you're talking about coding for spines. The diagnosis is very important, and I have some examples of that. We're going to look at the approach. Is it anterior or is it posterior? There's different codes for that. The location, of course, cervical, thoracic, spinal, sacral, what are we talking about? And the type of procedure that's being done. So those are some things you're looking at. Now, AAPC has a really good forum out there, a really good post in their knowledge center. And I've also given the link that they list five different principles that you determine for spine surgery. So if the provider is performing a decompression or a disectomy, then we begin with that single code. Then if they document an orthodesis or what we call a fusion, they're fusing those two bones together so that they won't move, then we have to select a code for that as well, the location and the approach of that fusion. If they document a bone graft, so if they had to take bone from another part of the body or if they harvest, you know, if they grew bone. So there's two different types of bone grafts that you could have. And then there's an add-on code for that. So we can see how this can get really complicated. There's so many different little steps and things to add on. 
if they document that they used instrumentation, a fixation, a plate, a rod, something like that, um, those are separate codes as well. So there is going to be another procedure for those codes. And then if they document anything else, some type of equipment used, um, harvesting of something else, uh, you know, sometimes they inject cells. So there's different um, other procedures that might be done. So there could be a lot of codes when you look at one spinal surgery, you could have three, four, five, six codes, depending upon how many levels you did, depending upon where it was and what was done. So there's the link for that um, AAPC um, blog that they had. So when we're looking at um, the types of procedures you can, you're doing, you can do anterior or anterior lateral or posterior or posterior lateral or a lateral transverse. So those are fusions that can be done. So they either come in from the front or they come in from the back. So those are the two different approaches that they use. So when we're coding posterior, it's very important to look at the number of levels that they did. Um, L1, L2, L3, how many levels did they do? T1, T2, T7, T8, T9, how many levels? There's a family of codes in spine surgery that look at posterior and anterior approaches for a spinal deformity. So that's very important. Every one of them says a spinal deformity. That's where some of your diagnosis is gonna come in. So you could have another example is, I picked out another code, 63270, laminectomy for excision of intraspinal lesion other than neoplasm, um, intradural in the cervical area. So for example, your diagnosis might be osteomyelitis, I know it's unspecified, but you might have osteomyelitis. That could go along with that procedure because they're taking out something other than a neoplasm. So it's very important to know your diagnosis as well when you're coding these. When instrumentation is used, you have to select the type that it is, the number of levels involved, and the placement of that instrument. And this is where that back te bat technique is wonderful in this um, section, this family of codes, because you could be using a wire, you could be using a rod, you could be using different things, and it depends on where they're connecting and where they stop, where they begin and where they terminate. It's very important. So the question was a facectomy. A facetectomy so, is a procedure to remove a portion of the vertebrae or more than one. So you could be removing a portion of a vertebrae or a vertebrae or two, you know, to relieve pressure and pain. So we can't just say what's the code for ORIF of a C6, C7, because like I showed you those steps, is it a decompression? Did they do this? Did they add that? What kind of instrumentation was this? What kind of open reduction internal fixation was this? Now, if it's a fracture, that's different as well. So there's different coding, um, the fracture. So you're either with a fracture, you got to do some something else because typically with a fracture, something else is going to happen. You're going to rub in that inner space or something's going to happen. There is one fracture code um, of the spine and that is for that um, axis and atlas, the C1 and C2 that they talk about or, you know, up more up the top of the spine, the base, so it's dealing with kind of the head, the jaw, that area. So we have to look at, it could be one of those 360,000 codes that this um, facetec facetectomy um, was dealing with. And then you got to look at the type of instrumentation that was used. So in the ORF, what what fixation did they use? And then did they do a graft? Did they pull something out of another place to um, cement it in there? Or how did they do it? A really great resource for anything orthopedic is Karen Zupko. So this link here brings you to orthopedic coding education. You can sign up for a free newsletter with them. And she has other other than orthopedics as well, but um, they are really good with orthopedics. And so you would get a newsletter. I think I get one every day and it's got just a different blog or different article or information in it. So it's a very useful resource. 
that is great stuff. I'll tell you what, you give me a, a heart any old day, I'll code that out the wazoo, the vascular system, but spines, as much as I love bones, mm. spines make me nervous because there's a whole lot of code you have to use. There's a whole lot. And I'm the, I just passed that. the COSC exam in November and I was stressing yeah. about the spines. Everybody said, oh, there's so many spines on there, but I didn't find it that bad, but I have a whole lot of notes in my CPT book. <laughs> and you and you have a background coding for spinal coding for orthopedics physicians, for 21 right? years. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still hard. We have another. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would I would take a pregnant person who is having a cardiac issue, still a little response, you know. <laughs> With neurological with diabetes, no, <laughs> with diabetes, <laughs> yeah, and a lesion. No. <laughs> so explain this That's one, Alicia, Alicia. Explain this one. Sorry, why would you listen to a CCO podcast? No, and, would you? Um, <laughs> no, why? You? Oh, yeah, okay, no, why? Like, why? <laughs> I'm still excited about her spine. Sorry. So. The reason we wanted to ask you this is because there are a couple, only a couple that I know of, podcasts out there for coders and medical uh, type billing um, topics. And honestly, they're I think they're just getting started. So if you think that CTO podcast would be beneficial to you, if we could make it relevant to uh, medical coding and billing, then let us know. We we want to to find out if that's something that would uh, we can pursue for you. So if you want to launch that poll, I'm not sure what questions yep. you asked. Yes, no. Yes is sort of like uh, you kind of listen to podcasts now and or, yeah. you know, um, you would probably do that if it, if it was relevant content. If, if it's no, it means like, okay, I don't really listen to podcasts at all. Um, so I probably wouldn't bother to, to uh, get listen involved. Listen to one of CCOs. First. <laughs> but if you don't and you, if you're not listening to podcasts, which you might listen to us because, you know, you're driving and you have other ways that you can listen mm -hmm. to us rather than getting on a webinar or watching us on YouTube or, or Facebook or whatever, then vote yes. And if there's another reason that I haven't thought of, then write in the question box wherever you are. Yeah, give us your feedback because, like I said before, we want to give you services that are relevant um, and beneficial to your career, as well as being a student, you know. So uh, CCO is, they intend, uh, CCO wants to help you become a coder, uh, help you pass the exam, and then help you maintain your credential. I am surprised. Report. This is great. Mm -hmm. Yes, 92%, no, 7%, and other reason, 1%. Okay. Great. That's okay. good to know. Okay. Um, I know I don't listen to podcasts, but uh, I watch podcasts <laughs> because I'm always in front of a computer. And so, um, you know, it, 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 again, uh, we weren't sure. So that affirms what we're thinking, that there might be... The uh, one percent, I think, v said, "Sure, if we can get CEUs in the question box." So I'm not sure how that would work. Hmm. Would that even be possible? Do you think? Oh uh, yeah, CEUs, maybe. Yeah, you're usually tested on the material. So if you could be yeah. tested, don't listen so I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, you can give you a link to go take the test and pick up the CEU. Yeah, I think it could be done. Great. Yeah, was, oh. yeah that's great. Thank you, you for doing see. that. Yeah. So we were wondering if anybody would be interested. So, and none of us have any problems talking, as you've noticed. So, <laughs> isn't that what a podcast is talking? <laughs> awesome. Okay, this is Alicia. Advanced care planning. We had a question come in that said, "My provider wants to bill more than once for counseling on end of life decisions. I know I can use nine nine four nine seven, but I don't think it can be billed more than once per patient." Am I wrong? Well, let's talk about it. That's a, what a great teaching moment. Let's talk first about what advanced care planning is, and then I got an answer for you. Um, as I was doing the research, it popped up. Ultimately, advanced care planning is 
can be more than what happens when I die. I want to plan for that. It's there's more involved to that. But what it means is that if you're incapacitated in any way, then I want my wishes known. I it, and it doesn't matter that you've told your loved one or you've told uh, your significant other or you know friends and family. Honestly, it's kind of like the documentation thing. If it's not written down, then it's not going to happen more or less. So this gives you a way to make those decisions and have them documented so that your family and loved ones don't have to to worry about uh, that aspect. And this can be done for you any stage in your life. Um, this is also a way for you to get information about what the possibilities are. And I truly appreciate um, hospice. I have a, a friend that I grew up with and then we were roommates in college and she became a social worker in hospice and has been doing that for over 20 years now actually kind of closer to 30 and you know what I it, it's it's wonderful it's a wonderful service that that people can have so it would explain what services are available there is actually an ICD code that can be used because we do need to have some type of ICD not just the CPT code that was mentioned and you can use Z71.89 which is other specified counseling remember whenever you see an ICD code and the term other is used that means it's documented we just don't have a code for it at this time so that would fall under the range of advanced care planning so there's your diagnosis code that you can use but Let's talk about this CPT code 99497. It is for the ACP and it's not only just do you know talking about it but um, discussing uh, other types of directives, what type of forms are involved and also getting resources available to you. So it's not like you have to make a decision at that time to use the 99497. Okay. It's an inf it can be an informational counseling session. Uh, it also can be part of completing those forms for you. Uh, the first 30 minutes it has to be face to face with the patient or family member or surrogate. OK, and and I uh, underline that because I wanted to make sure that you realize that it's multiple ways that that this can come across, but it has to be face to face with somebody. And the first 30 minutes usually lets you know if it's time based, there's going to be more than one code possibly or you're going to do an additional 30 minutes. Right. Anything in a CPT that's after the semicolon. Uh, a good idea to highlight that. That's how we teach the BAT technique. Relevant legal forms that you may not even be aware of. There's actually a healthcare proxy that can be filled out. Uh, you've probably heard of the durable power of attorney uh, when you know we've got that set up as our folks, my husband and I, as our folks are getting older, they each set us up as uh, you know, like the firstborn to be their durable power of attorney if something happens to them. There is a living will that can be created. And I think a lot of people have heard of durable power of attorneys, living wills, but um, there is one form called an MOLST, which is a medical order for life sustaining treatment. And that kind of just explains what do I want done and not done? Like, well, I'll. I would let you help me with respirations. I don't mind to be innovated, but I really don't want CPR or I don't want, uh, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to be in a coma for more than a certain amount of time and um, so on and so forth. So it's all established before something like that would happen to you. Place of service when you're dealing with an ACP is not a factor. You don't, it doesn't matter where it's being filled out, but once it's, um, the, the process is started, it could be done at the hospital, it could be done at a, a skilled facility, it could be done at the doctor's office, uh, 
however, it does have to meet the criteria of being a face-to-face -face visit. And then you've got that first 30 minutes. Now the billing, how are we going to build this? Ultimately, it has to be billed by the managing physician. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a face-to-face -face visit, right? The, the physician that's managing the process of filling out the ACP, helping them fill out the forms even and stuff like that is critical here. Time-based, you do have an add-on code. Just a heads up, whenever you see something that's time-based, it's going to tell you, you'll either gonna hit like times two or something, but a lot of times it will state um, an add-on code underneath that. And if you're new to coding, an add-on code cannot be listed first um, and it'll have a plus symbol there in front of the code. So if a person, for example, 46 minutes, the 99497 sta states the first 30 minutes, right? Then you have an add-on code to let them know there was an additional amount of time that was involved 46 minutes total to, to provide this service. And these are the type of services that the discussions could go a little longer, right? Um, there's a, a lack of knowledge out there about what services are available, what forms need to be in place, what do you do with the forms, where do you keep the forms, you know, as well as, well, if I tell them I don't want to be innovated, what does that actually mean? You know, things like that. Also with time uh, based codes, there's no limit of the times or how frequently that ACP can be reported. Okay, but the key is to a given beneficiary in a given period of time. So yeah, it can be billed more than once. And it would make sense. Let's say you spent, you know, um, uh, 25 minutes discussing it and saying, is this a good idea? Do I need to think about having this done? Uh, you know, what type of forms are involved? So they talk about it and they say, you know, I'm going to go do some research, ask my family, uh, discuss some of the things that I think are options I want to do. And then um, can I come back and talk to you again? And then again, you come back and that time you spend 46 minutes filling out forms and so on and so forth. So yes, the answer to the question that was given was yes. But if you bill multiple times for that single beneficiary, then CMS is going to want to make sure you document specifically what's happening. You know, how come you're you're doing this twice well because one was a consult to explain what forms you know were needed and what services that are used at end of life and then the next time it was discussion of uh, uh, the forms what to fill out and explaining medical terminology to the patient you know so again you um, need to document a health change or status or wishes regarding that so you fill out the forms, you spend the 30 minutes, and then you come back and, you know, uh, later and you say, you know what, my, the patient decided that they've changed their mind. They read an article that when a person's in a coma, that they can still hear people. And so they don't want life support taken off for a coma, things like that. And so that document that and let them know that's why they changed their mind. Uh, you can also do telehealth. And uh, so when now of course it says face-to-face -face visit right but what the physician would do was use a telehealth code for the counseling uh, cms actually gave an example and so i went ahead and put this in you can get it from the cms website they got a 68 year old male with heart failure and diabetes he has multiple medications uh, they do an enm two diseases including adjusting medications is appropriate in addition to discussing short-term treatment option the patient expressed interest in discussing long-term treatment options etc etc then it goes on to say that uh, he wants to know what adversely affects his decision-making capacity. And so CMS states that in this instance, you do the ENM service and then you append that 99497 with that, okay? It's for the first 30 minutes, 
right? And then that's how it how it would be billed. You got your EM service and then the additional uh, 99497. And again, that can be found on CMS. It's exciting stuff, but again, not always something that we want to talk about. Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. We got a sale? Oh, we do. <laughs> And of course, CCO every so often has a flash sale. And right now we're celebrating a 30% off courses and blitzes until this Saturday, the 25th at midnight. And you can learn more about that at cco.us slash flash sale. And I'll grab the link and throw that in the chat for you guys if you want to check that out. Um, if you are also thinking, mm, you know what, I've got everything I need. I've bought everything CCO offers. You can always share it with a friend. <laughs> that Good great. point. Good point. And we've got Thank two back to back for Jennifer right now. Yeah, I'm gonna skip out early tonight. So I'm doing two of them back to back. So. I did, this person asked a question about the Hickpix book. So if you're kind of like me, it might have been collecting dust in the corner somewhere. So they didn't get a lot of training on how to use the Hickpix book. So how often would they expect those codes to be used once they start, once they start working? It can be a little bit nerve wracking actually, and we'll go over some of that in a bit. So Hickpix, Healthcare Common Procedural Coding System. Of course, we like our um, abbreviations much better. So, uh, HICPIX is, um, it's everything that services still provided to people, but they're not in the CPT book. So how do we classify all those services? So actually Medicare and Medicaid came up with HICPIX um, and said that there's still services that are given, but they don't have a CPT code for some reason. They're they're exclusional, they're different. So HICPICS, of course, you have a five digit code just like CPT, but it's gonna start with an alpha character and then four numerical digits after that. So just something to be aware of from the billing side, not every carrier is going to cover HICPICS codes. So the items you might find in the, in the HICPICS manual may not be covered by the insurance company. It just depends. And some of them even say, um, like G codes are procedures or professional services that are temporary codes. H codes are temporary national codes for government entities other than Medicare. So you're not gonna send an H code into Medicare. S codes are temporary national codes that are non-Medicare. Um, and even not everybody recognizes them, like Blue Cross Blue Shield may not, Aetna may not, you know, it just depends. T codes are national codes established for state Medicaid agencies. So you're only gonna send a T code to the Medicaid agency. So there, there's differences within these codes. So these codes um, can, the permanent codes are updated every year. Um, however, they are added and deleted throughout the year. So if you're anybody else in orthopedics or doing any other kind of injection, you'll find that some of those J codes they all of a sudden, you all of a sudden they just stop getting paid and you're like, what happened? It's in the book. Well, because they could delete them throughout the year. So some of those J codes that you might give an injection or a drug for just might suddenly stop being paid. So the temporary codes, they update them quarterly, which allows the insurance company to establish a code for that service. So like the C codes, those are only gonna be used for outpatient um, uh, OPPS, outpatient um, prospective payment systems, on Medicare claims for hospitals. So you're not going to see those anyplace else. Where S codes are temporary, um, as there's no national codes, but they're needed to process claims or identify services or programs. So just flipping through the book, take a look at some of these and you can understand why. Um, originally, when I first started doing primary care, gosh, I think my daughter was four, so 10, 12 years ago, um, they had an S code for smoking cessation or, you know, counseling for smoking cessation. Well, as you can see now, we have a code for that. 
So now there's a CPT code. So it used to be an S code and now there's CPT. So eventually some of these codes may be picked up and converted into a CPT because they're temporary. Either they could be a new procedure, something new coming out, they're testing it. So they're um, seeing how well it does. And then if it's popular enough or necessary or required, then they'll convert it to a CPT code. So using HickPix, you're, if you're worried about using it or how often you're going to use it, like I said, you know, I was in my field for years with an old book. It's probably four or five years old because we didn't use it that often. We, the only thing in orthopedics we ever got out of there is our Q codes, which we already know for casting, and our J codes for injections, we already know. So we never really used it that often. It just depends on where you are. A codes are ambulance. So of course, if you work for some kind of hospital system or something like that, then you might use those A codes pretty often. J codes might be used by dermatologists, um, really any field who's injecting any kind of drug or medication. So if something looks familiar here, we have G0008, administration of an influenza virus vaccine. Well, there's a CPT code for administration of a vaccine. It's 90471. So now this is where the confusing part comes in. Um, we can have a Q code for casting supply, um, S code, medical records copying fee. Um, nobody's, I don't know how many people are going to pay it, but maybe like a um, uh, possibly a work comp organization maybe may pay for that. So you can look at some of these codes, they may not all get paid. But if a CPT code and a HICPIC code describe the same service, you have to look at that payer guideline to see which code you're going to report. Medicare requires you use that HICPICS code. So when you give a influenza vaccine to a Medicare patient, you're going to do the 907, I forget what the influenza is, I forget off the top of my head, but then you're going to use the G0008, not 90471, because Medicare requires, if there's a HICPIX code describing the same service as the CPT, you use the HICPIX. Another example that they have is colorectal cancer screening. Of course, we know those are all in the uh, 4,500, 45,000 section of CPT. Well, Medicare requires the G code, not the CPT code. So there's some differences that you'll see um, among the codes. In this, this book is actually, probably only half the book is actual codes. The other half of the book is a whole lot of information. So HICPICS also includes NCCI edits for those HICPICS codes, because NCCI edits and CPT, you can usually find on the Medicare CMS website. So what of these services, these two things, maybe you have a colorectal cancer screening and something else, can those two go together? So you got to look up the NCCI edit. If you have ever heard me talking about billing, I love the Medicare manual on the website, <laughs> the um, IOM, Internet Only Manual 100.04 for Medicare. And there is actually a description of all of that information in the HICPICS book. Um, there's about 80 pages of modifiers for HICPICS modifiers. If you've ever opened up the front of the HICPICS book, it double folds out and you have all those modifiers in there. It gives a description of every one of those and an example. So if you're curious what that means or if you should use QX versus QY, look it up and see what is the difference between the two. It'll give you an example. It also has a table of drugs that you can cross-reference the HICPIC codes for the C, J, and Q codes. Um, so you, you know that you're using Depromedrol, you can look it up and it'll tell you what code that's going to relate to. So it's pretty helpful in that aspect as well. It, I don't know many specialties that work exclusively out of the HICPICS unless you work for a DME, Durable Medical Supply Company. But um, otherwise, it depends on which specialty you're in or which, you know, hospital might use it more or things like that. So there are certain areas that do use it, but you could be get a job in the field that doesn't even touch it at all. So That's exciting stuff. I know that 
a lot of times students get intimidated because they don't get a lot of education in the Hicks Picks manual, but it's mm -hmm. only because they just, and plus you look up the codes just like you do in the CPT manual, so it's the same, right? So don't have to train you how to look it up. It's the same as CPT. <laughs> yeah. All right, shit, Jennifer's got yeah. another one, so I'm gonna take my camera off and get ready to move it over for you. Okay. So somebody asked a difference between two codes, 96136 and 96127. They pretty much look like the same thing. So we're going to go into what each of those codes actually are. So 96127, this is a behavioral assessment code. So the description in CPT says um, brief emotional or behavioral assessment e.g., which means example, which means detailed, not i.e. as in um, in other words. So e.g. means example. That means these are those assessments. Uh, depression inventory, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, like the ADHD scale. There are others, but they're, those are not the only three. So um, with scoring and documentation, so we need to make sure that course documentations in there per standardized instrument. So whatever instruments being used. Now 96136 looks the same because it's a psychological or neuropsychological test administered and scoring by a physician or other health, health qualified healthcare professional. Two or more tests, any method, your first 30 minutes. And then of course there's an add-on code 96137 uh, for additional time. So yes, those two do seem the same. So let's kind of break them down and see what the difference is. So 96127 is a behavioral assessment of developmental or behavioral screenings. So during mental health screenings, a provider, we're not saying a mental health provider, this could be any provider, is trying to detect mental health symptoms in an otherwise healthy patient. So we, we know there's Physically, nothing wrong with this patient, so let's look at mentally or developmentally what might be wrong with this patient. So these screenings, they could be a paper questionnaire that somebody's filling out. It could be some kind of computer platform like um, BrainCheck or um, Cognitrax, some different um, computer software programs that are out there. Patient could be filling it out in a waiting room or in the exam room, or the physician could be interviewing them looking at specific disorders like a generalized anxiety or geriatric depression scale um, that have, we see this often in some of the elderly patients seeing how well they do at home seeing looking at the assessment of how they are at home and and um, making sure that they are not getting depressed but once that possible mental health condition is established through that screening or some other kind of test or they might have a medical condition that relates to a mental health condition, then the medical necessity is established and to administer those tests. So 96136 is the psychological or neuropsychological test for the administration of a test and scoring of the, by the provider of multiple tests, two or more. So at least two tests have to be administered. If you only did one, then you don't bill for this. So um, some of the other, and there have been new codes that were added last year in 2019 um, to distinguish between a doctor performing these and a technician. So it's different codes if a doctor's doing it versus a technician. So there's other differences. 96127 said a brief assessment. Where 96136, you're looking at, you gotta have 30 minutes there. So 96136, that also requires a psychologist or a neuropsychologist or some other qualified healthcare professional to administer the test. I don't know, just a second. I can't hear you. I thought I hit it again. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> My son's going to bed. So, <laughs> um, 
96127, so they gave a couple examples, like at the ADHD test. So these are some of the other type of screening tools that an office might use, a pediatric symptom checklist, strengths and difficulties questionnaire, perhaps with a, um, with a uh, underdeveloped child, but also with elderly, you may do a strengths and difficulties questionnaire, early childhood screening, a back depression inventory. So some of these screenings, you want to just kind of look at a brief assessment and see if there is another problem there. So 96136 can involve multiple test sessions. So the psychological, neuropsychological um, code you can do multiple sessions. They might need to come in more than one time. You might need to take some time in between to assess it, um, some non-face-to-face -face time, do some feedback, read the results, things like that. So that could happen over multiple days. And if that's the case, you wanna submit it as if the data service was that last data service. So if they came in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you're submitting Wednesday as your claim with all the time grouped together. So to see the difference between these, these could be like the, I can never say that, what is that? Rush, Rush, Rush. I, I think it's pronounced Rochak, although yeah. I know it doesn't sound <laughs> like that, but my son's had that. That's why I can't say. <laughs> the MMPI, which is a uh, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. So looking for personality disorders or, or the um, Weschler Intelligence Scale. So, so you can see how so the, some of these are more involved, more in depth. So you already know what the problem is with the patient. And now you're looking at tests um, to determine where and how to treat, where originally we're looking to make sure that that there is nothing else wrong. So one, you have, you know, different personnel performing them different amounts of time, as well as different kinds of levels of um, difficulty with these exams and assessments. That's really, really interesting. My son has had um, a neuropsychologist and a neuropsychiatrist before he had his epilepsy study because they wanted to be able to map, you know, what damage was in his brain and so on and so forth. So I'm familiar with some of those, but I never paid attention <laughs> to the codes that they were using. So, hey, this is a great time to give you a heads up about some of the people that have um, sent us. Hold on a second. Guess, Say goodbye to uh, Jennifer. Oh, Very Jennifer, safe. that's right. Gotta Jennifer's got to go. Jennifer's got to go. Helping guys. somewhere tonight. So thanks, everybody. I'll see you later. <laughs> thanks, Jennifer. Thanks. So this is my time to take over a little piece of the webinar and tell you about our CCO reviews. I was busy in the background here. So number one, we have a lot of people who like to give us reviews because they have sound found uh, something that's been useful for them here at CCO. So we've had over 693 reviews that we don't go and ask for. We actually don't have any system to actually do that. But over the years, people have come to our site and we've made it plain where to find us and they've left us a review. These are two that I pulled out. Number one, because they're kind of special, I'll tell you why. So I'll, let me read the first one. It says, pass the first try. I passed CPC exam the first try, all due to buying the Blitz Review after completing the AAPC course. I did exactly what they said to do and it worked. Wished I would have had done the CPC course with CCO instead. I'm a visual learner and they give you the insight to put it all together. I bought the Blitz three weeks before my exam. Without it, I would have not have passed. Love it all to, love it all to the bat technique, review videos, support and tips on how to pass the exam. Having exams just like the board exam clinched my strategy with confidence. Love all you at CCO and a big thank you from Mary Downs. Was she one of your students there, Alicia? I know the name Mary Downs very well. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mary. So that one because um, that's that's sort of sort of a general one that we that we get a lot of. We hear right? that. Oh, yeah. Kind of down yeah, to the wire good. and there's a little bit panic. So so we have some solutions for that. Now, I have a wife who's from Brazil and she speaks English as a second language and she's always concerned about that. And I have not edited this next one because I wanted to leave in 
her English just the way that it says there. I think she's from Asia. I'm not going to say where because I'm I'd be just guessing, but it's Hai Nagun, I believe her surname. And she says she almost gave almost gave up. I almost gave up after my third attempts for CBC exam not successful. I got encouragement from my colleague at AAPC and she mentioned me about CCO and VAT technique. I decided to invest to CCO and it is true that pass the exam, CPC exam on your first try. English is my second language. I can do it, that means you can do it too. Thank you, CCO. Yeah. So, and you know what? She, we, we called out her name as one of the graduates on the other page. Yeah, Jennifer nice. said her name. Yeah, so all this, yeah. these are all just recent. These are the recent. most recent ones this month. Yeah. Boyd, I had no idea we had 690 reviews and 93 reviews in there. That's, yep, there you go. Wow, yeah, that's, that, that's that cool. makes me feel really, really good, actually. <laughs> well, that's nice. Yep. I don't know okay. any company that has that. <laughs> good point. Even yeah, car that's salesmen. Good point. <laughs> that's a good point. Okay, I'll let you go here, Alicia. Okay, all right. Uh, we had another question that came in, and it, it actually came in on one of the other webinars that we do throughout the week. It said, I read an article on robotic surgery and wondered how this type of procedure changes the way we code. It is an area I know nothing about. Where should I look for more information? Well, of course, I love doing research, and, and you know, as a coder, you're going to be doing lots of research. So I went out and did some. Robotic surgery has been out there for quite a while, actually. Not necessarily is it covered by all the payers. However, what it benefits is that you can get very, very precise in the procedure. And um, also the uh, robotic devices can get in where somebody's hand can't necessarily do that, or even if you're doing laparoscopic surgery, they can put cameras in a such smaller area. It's pretty fascinating. So uh, that's what the technology really refers to, robotic surgery, is that it, there is a surgeon that's doing the work, and yet it's a uh, machine that's on the other end. And you know, it's not, it, it looks big and bulky when you see pictures of it. I didn't pull a graphic, uh, but you can go out and look at graphics all day long, do Google images of robotic assisted surgery. Uh, and, but the surgeon is controlling a device. Think of it like you're playing a controller on a game and, and watching visually what's, what's happening. Uh, you could as well blow up the picture even bigger, right? Because you're on a screen and can see things. Uh, so it, it, it's very exciting. The, uh, the key points to know is that Dexterity is enhanced and you can do things on a micro scale that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Now, that, again, they've been doing it for a long time. The very first procedure that I remember actually watching was a hysterectomy being done. thought that was kind of exciting. I did wanted to add this little caveat because it came from where I was able to pull this information. And I think this is why a lot of payers still don't pay for it, not all of them. Uh, it said, however, research indicates surgical and anesthesia times are typically longer, often by 50% or more when robotic procedures are employed and uh, yet the coding cost without documentation and clinical benefits. So honestly, the, the payer says, we don't pay you for the instruments you use. We pay you for the skill that you have and use. Okay, so they don't care if you uh, use some newfangled equipment to do the same procedure as if you use something that they used 10 years ago. They're not gonna pay you more for the equipment. And so it's not always cost effective to get the equipment for these types of procedures and train the providers to do them. Also, you know, you got to weigh the cost if it's going to be, if you're going to be under anesthesia longer, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that being said, what are 
the areas that these procedures are being done. Cardiac is doing them, which of course, really precise procedure on a micro level. Yeah, you're dealing with the heart and the vascular system, gastrointestinal, uh, gynecological, like I said, the hysterectomy was the first one that I had seen, maxillofacial, Again, being very minute, neurosurgery. Uh, my son, they're you know mapping his brain to see if they can go in and zap part of his brain where the epilepsy is. And um, if you can do that with a machine, you know, all the better. Uh, the machine again is not doing all the work. The the neurosurgeon's doing it, and yet the the machine is being guided. Kind of. Would it be like a drone? I don't know. I think of it as playing video games. Ophthalmology, orthopedic, and urology. Ophthalmology, really tiny, tiny things that you have to do uh, regarding the eyes. Urology, most of the time I think of this type of procedure, and I know they do it for, prostect for prostectomies because, um, you know, we you can do a lot of damage by removing the prostate, or maybe we only need to remove portions of it. The example that I was able to pull was actually from urology. And so I'm going to show that to you here in just a second. Modifier 22 is not appropriate. So don't think that you're going to be using that if um, uh, if the sole use of the modifier is just to report that it's robotic assistance, it's not applicable. Now, you could use it if there's complications involved, meaning that, you know, there was more complexity. But you can't use modifier 22 just because you're uh, using this technology. It's also uh, not appropriate to use modifier 80, 81, 82, or AS, because these are not surgical assistant or assistant surgeons, even though it's surgically assisting the surgeon, it's a robot. You know, it, these, these modifiers are only used for a, a human <laughs> assisting the, uh, the procedure. I also, I know this is really hard to see, but if you're in our CCO club, you'll be able to get these links for that I footnoted for you. What are some of the codes and examples that I could pull out for you? Uh, the 55866 is the one that came in the example that was given. Uh, we're gonna do a laparoscopic surgical prostectomy and um, it's a retropubic radical which means they're going to take more tissue, including nerve spare, sparing. And if we need to try to preserve the, the nerve uh, as much as possible, or uh, the patient will get erectile dysfunction, including uh, robotic assistance when performed. So this means it includes it if there is the ability to do that, but that doesn't mean that um, you have to have a robot to use this cord. This one it says includes robotic assistance when performed. 55866. Five, and then remember, Jennifer had just told us about S codes. Well, here's one S2900 surgical techniques requiring use of robotic surgical systems, list separately in addition to the primary code procedure. Right? So they're feeling the ground. Is this going to become a regular code that we use as, uh, you know, and I think it was over 10 years ago when I saw that hysterectomy. 55899 is another code that could be used for this unlisted procedure male genitalia system. So if we're, uh, it's not applicable because the 55866, because it's nerve sparing or whatever, uh, then we have a backup 55899. So the example that they gave first was when we did the laparoscopic prostectomy uh, with robotic assistant, then the bill is going to go out with the 55866, and they're going to use the add on S2900 because they're going to be tracking it. but you're only going to get paid based on the 55866. There's no additional money that comes with the S2900. They're really just tracking it statistically. And you know, I say constantly, we 
code for statistical purposes. It just happens to be a convenient way to get paid. So that's what everybody talks about. The other example was to use uh, the laparoscopic prostatectomy uh, with the robotic assistance and um, the physician is going to build the service with a 55899 and uh, because it's an unlisted procedure with a genital system then uh, if it's a supplied an unlisted coat and it's a laparoscopic radical retropubic prostatectomy using a da Vinci surgical system then 55899 is manually priced based on the allowance for the listed price of 55866. Because we have a specific um, uh, way the procedure is being performed. And last, uh, just a heads up, I added this because, again, most of the time, whatever Medicare does, everybody else does. But I did find this note that um, UHC considers S2900 not separately reimbursable. So uh, that's important to know. In other words, they're just not going to pay for it. They're not going to pay more for the procedure being done with a robot. That's the way that reads. There you go. Pretty interesting. And we're going to see more and more of this technology done. Um, you know, but you're not going to have small hospitals investing in the robotic equipment if um, the reimbursement's not there. You're going to have foundations and uh, uh, teaching hospitals and stuff like that being used. Hey, we are ready for another poll. Are you going to launch it, Boyd? Already launched. What is your oh, medical fine. background? Phone up too high. What is your medical background? Select all that apply: clinician, provider, coder, or other, or none. And let us know in the question box if you are one of those others. Which Oops. other is? I keep hitting the wrong button when I'm streaming here. So <laughs> That's all right. We figured it out. So um, let's see what we got. We got 75%. So you guys are great tonight. You've been very attentive. Thanks for being that way. I'm going to close I it. I see in. Susan said patient advocate. I think she said that earlier. I saw it come through. Good. Nice. I'm going to wait till 80%. Here we go. 80% in five, four. Three, two, oh, there we go. Nice, Boyd. Sure. <laughs> Read them off, Alicia. I can't. I can't see it. Oh, really? Sorry. Okay. No. Clinician, 7%. Provider, 1%. Mostly coders at 66%. Others are 25%. And none are 12%. Let's see what we got for... I saw a chiropractor, a nurse mm -hmm. assistant, vascular ultrasound massage therapist, quality admin, billing manager. Nice. Med tech, great. Those are great jobs. Yeah. And for joining us. that knowledge that we can give you through here may pique your interest in, in making a lateral move into getting into coding or just make you better at your job that you already have. So yep. sharing that knowledge. All right. This was a Remote fun question. Yeah, we've actually talked about this a little bit you know and in fact boyd may i don't know he how many times have you heard us talk about this all the time at least once <laughs> all the way yeah I want to say more, more, um, more, than, more than once a month month a month once a year i was yeah. gonna say well it's the big word remote coding you know and the uh this also had come up again recently with several people asking about it. And we, you can go out to our YouTube channel and Boyd has um, some uh, tidbits already that pulled out from other webinars and some other webinars that we've done that we've talked about this. Uh, but uh, they had asked, a couple people had asked, can you give me more information about working remotely? It seems like everybody wants to work remotely in medical coding, but I feel skeptical about starting a career without the full picture. And that was what caught my interest. Kudos for, for saying that because um, it's not all that it's cracked up to be always. Now, everybody that works at CCO works remote. Uh, 
uh, if you're working for CCO, but some of the people that work with us have other jobs that, that they do as well. And um, that, and some of them, them work remote with the other jobs and some of them actually work in a, a facility or a location or a school. And all of the CCO people um, have done both at one time or another. So I think that we have the ability to give you a, the reality of what it, what it is. And what happens is you see people advertising either their education or um, mostly education, <laughs> uh, come and get trained with us, work from home, uh, you know, studying in four months, you could be working from home making $60,000 a year. And that's just not reality. Uh, and the full picture is, yes, you could get trained in four months. That that can be done. Uh, you know, that's, uh, and especially if you have a medical background, you know, uh, there's lots of ways to get your education. Of course, we do education full time, but um, some people go to a brick and mortar school. Some people get uh, their training through in, uh, with a degree uh, program. Other people uh, get online training and uh, some go to community colleges, some, you know, there's just several ways that, that the training can be done. But on average, if you're just learning to, to code, four months is, a, is reality, you could do that. However, you're not gonna start out making $60,000 a year. You will get paid well, you know, usually, but you also don't just walk in and get a job right away. You know, you have to put time in and, Every year that you work in this industry, you tend to make more money. Now, you may not make more money in the job that you have, but if you go from one job to another, all of that experience, that time that's under your belt, ends up meaning that you're probably going to, you know, um, have more in your uh, pocket when you go to another job. The turnover is not very high with this career because it's a fun job to do and it pays well and uh, and you can have a lifestyle that uh, where you could work from home or uh, it's not physically demanding. So there's a lot of people that have physical disabilities or uh, uh, injuries or health conditions that need them to have that sedentary type job. That all being said, the reality of working remote, and it's becoming more and more um, frequent that these jobs are going remote because as of like 2016, I think it was, uh, medical records needed to become electronic. So now that we don't have to look at paper as much, it's easier to communicate back and forth. So it, it is much more of a reality to get those jobs, but you don't always just graduate and get a remote job and you may not want one. So the reality is the hours, um, you still have to work a 40 hour work week. And you have to keep in mind that if you're working from home and you're working 40 hours, yes, you could split your time up and say work, you know, I'm going to work um, four hours in the morning and then I'm going to work four hours in the evening. That's that could be done. You know, you could do that. Or um, some people say, I don't want to work Monday and Tuesday. I want to work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And, you know, I want to wake. I want to work my five days in, that include the weekend. And some employers don't care if you do that. Um, I've worked remote. If the jobs that wanted you to work Monday through Friday, nine to five, because that's when everybody else that worked in the office was there and we communicated back and forth. Uh, however, it, it just depends. The pay is, tends to be a little higher when you work remote. Uh, that is because that it, when you work in a specific area, your pay is based on your geographic area. So if there's several hospitals in the area that you live, then you're gonna get paid more than if you work for uh, a hospital system that's you know, an hour away from the rural town that you live in, right? Uh, 
uh, you know, if there is, if there's a university or whatever you're living in, people that live in the city make more money, put it that way, than rural people. Not always. Uh, it isn't like, so it's not so much supply and demand, I guess. But the other thing you have to consider that often people overlook is that you may not be actually an employee. You may be taking on contract work. And so if you're working through a recruiter, you want to find out from them, and I encourage you to get a recruiter if you're thinking of working remote, um, is, you know, are, am I being hired as contract work or is this, is am I an employee? And the big thing is, are they going to take out taxes? That's what you want to know. Because the first year that I worked remote, oh, I was really excited. I was making really, really good money. But when I went to do my taxes, that was, that was uh, very, I, I was aware of it and I planned for it, but I wasn't a, a, aware of the sticker shock I was going to get. So luckily I had kept track of all kinds of receipts and stuff like that and done my research ahead of time. So again, taxes can be um, something you may not think about until it's too late. Uh, also, some companies pay you by the hour and some pay you by the encounter that you do. Now, if you get paid by the hour, they, and a lot of times they don't care where you put your hours in as long as you give them 40 hours. And that means that they'll have a, um, they'll have a quota. So in risk adjustment, it's like 5.5 um, charts an hour, but in um, pro fee coding or especially, it could be 30 um, encounters an hour, right? Uh, it, it didn't used to be that many, but now everything's electronic and you don't have to read handwriting and so on and so forth. So it's goes a lot faster. Plus your providers log in codes now and they never used to do that. You'd have to look at them up from scratch before, uh, but most of them have already got it in the EMR. Um, if you work via encounter, if you're really new to an area, then say you're going to start doing cardiology and you haven't done cardiology before, then you got a little leeway that, well, you're just not going to make as, they're not going to have to pay you if you can't keep up to speed and then you get to, you make more money the, the faster you are, right? Um, and you can make really good money if you're fast. So that's something to keep in mind. Also, owning your own equipment. Now, the last remote job I did, they gave me a, a desktop computer and they gave me two external monitors to use. They weren't mine. Uh, everything came, they even gave me a phone, like the company phone the, that you'd keep on your desk. And you could dial in <laughs> and literally, you know, or you could just hit an extension. And even though the, they were in a different state, we could talk. Um, however, when I was no longer doing that, all that got boxed up and sent back to them because it was their equipment. That means you have to have a place the, to keep that equipment and you have to keep, it doesn't belong to you. You got to keep it clean. Uh, you got to keep your children away from it. It isn't something that you're going to look up and play. Um, what's that thing they play on fake? Candy Crush. Can't play on Candy Crush. <laughs> Stuff like that. You can't watch a, a video on YouTube. Uh, often it has a VPN associated with it. So you got to make sure your internet can handle a VPN. Satellites don't work real well with VPN. So that's important to know. Or you could be using your own equipment and logging in to a uh, specific site where everything's tracked. But that means that you are, are uh, in charge of making sure that nobody else has access or viruses and stuff like that can get access to that. Children in the house is a reality. So um, you have to remember that you cannot keep, you have to keep regular office hours for yourself. Maybe your employer wants you to, but you know, that means if you have a sick child, then yeah, you can check on them, but you're, you're going to have to have somebody else come and take care of them. You are not going to work remote from home to save uh, a fee on babysitters, put it that way. And you can't have your um, office in the kitchen. You need a designated office space because the equipment is expensive. It may not belong to you. And um, you do want extra monitors and stuff. Soft skills is something that I know some people that are not extroverts like me, they're introverts, may not 
um, just because you're an introvert doesn't mean you don't have soft skills, but uh, soft skills are still looked at even if you work remote. There are times where you have to communicate with the provider, even on the phone. You may not be in the same state, but you have to call them up. You may have to do video conferencing. You may have to uh, send emails and you need to be professional, right? And so those soft skills come across. Uh, as much as you uh, say that you wanna be able to work in your pajamas every day, um, yes, you you could but um you know after a while in my opinion it affects your performance so you need you may not have to go put a face on but you still need to brush your hair brush your teeth and get dressed <laughs> you know because it comes across when you talk on the phone uh when you type it's a mentality thing so uh always know that soft skills still have to continually be worked on and that's my tidbits uh, over the reality, just things that now you can go do your own research, uh, research, you need to definitely talk to people that are working remote and ask them the pros and cons. Say, be upfront with me, what's the pros and cons? It is a lot of fun though. I can't imagine myself going back to a desk at somebody else's office. Even when I think I wanna dress up. <laughs> I don't want to wear heels. Uh, we have another poll. We do. Yeah. Let's find out if anybody has heard of the CCO Club. Let's find out if you've heard about our, what I like to call an institution, I guess now, here at CCO. Mm. Yeah. The CCO Club is a question, if you have heard about it, yes. If you've joined, that would be yes. And no, I have decided not to join up to this point or no, I didn't know about it, is it important for my career? And then Alicia's gonna tell you a little bit about it while we're answering. Um, go ahead, Alicia. Well, the CCO uh, Club, when Lorraine started talking about this and when we developed it in the very beginning, um, it, you know, it, 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 didn't, it didn't take on the aspects that we thought at first, but it has become a game changer. And, um, it is an area that you can get contact with all of us at CCO. You can get um, subject matter experts. We have uh, not only your instructors, but we also know people. Uh, we have mentors and peers and subject matter experts that, that are networked with us. Oh, sorry. Do I need to hit the next slide? Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's about okay. the club. Oh, so sure. hey, perfect. Okay. Um, but you know, one of the best things besides being able to ask questions and have that having that contact with us is the fact that every time we do a webinar, it's not only is it recorded, but uh we have it transcribed and then it's developed into a CEU package. The CEU packages you can go back and you can listen to let's say you don't need CEUs but you just want more information about you know uh, what uh, uh, Jennifer had talked about earlier you know and you know or you know that she's a uh, billing specialist as well and you want to to go back and refer back to what she said that's brilliant you can do that and 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 it's transcribed and the club members have access there's all kinds of exclusive content that's in there and then we stopped dividing things up into like single CEUs we started packaging CEUs so you get like five CEUs on cardiology not just one you can get 10 CEUs on you know, interventional radiology, or maybe it's spine surgery that you need work on. Uh, maybe it's compliance and they're, they're packaged together. So you can get CD, the CEUs uh, as well as that product support that comes with, on, you know, we, we cherish our club members and we always answer their questions first. I guess it's, that's the simplest way to say it. If you're interested in the club, cco.us uh, forward slash club, um, the, the people in the club have a lot of fun and I learned a lot from them as well, but it's an easy way for us to get stuff that we've researched to you um, quicker. And the survey results are here and it says basically of the people on this webinar, 49% are in the club right now 
and no are 25 percent who have not decided to join uh, at this point and they didn't know about it was 25 percent so a nice kind of even wow. split here between between things 25 25 if and 49 if you just want more information about it, it's really easy. We've done some other videos Boyd's put up on the page. Um, go to the, the cco.us forward slash club, and then you can um, see everything listed out, you know, if, if it's something that would benefit you. And, uh, and a little heads up, some other things are going to change in the club. Some additional perks are coming that we'll be able to tell you about next month so if you get in now start this, it's been around for almost what two three years i think now in various yeah, yeah. Different forms. so yeah. um it's there we're not going anywhere at this point so i think the key voice. word is community too yeah, it's, yeah. It is, it's a club but it's a community everybody kind of knows each other it's fun to be in there yeah, yeah. Cool. I was looking oh. to see when the actual date was, but okay. Let's go back to our last one. I think we're at nine thirty actually right now, and you're going to be the okay. only person for the for Q and A. So I don't see any reason why you couldn't finish this up. Um, okay, right now, great. our webinar is officially over. At least did an extra one um, yeah. than normal because whatever she just decided. I made a <laughs> And we've got five of your questions for the end right after this from our chat questions during the webinar that we've got answered so we've got put those prepared and alicia will know the answer or she won't and then we'll put them in the we'll put them in for another webinar it's to be answered not a stump alicia night <laughs> especially if, if uh jennifer's not here i'm not very good with the billing questions like she is and she's sharp uh, there you go this question came out in in two parts and so uh, it's about infusions. Infusions are difficult on the best days, but once you get it, it kind of makes sense. And it's very repetitive. It's not like it's a whole lot of codes that you have to use for infusions, but the verbiage and the terminology kind of, you stumble over it. But if you deal with, you know, ERs, uh, or they call them EDs, I'm still old, where they, you know, ERs, uh, or, uh, clinics that are doing things like chemo, then again, in, in infusions are going to be a part of your life and this won't bother you. Uh, so the first question that came in had said uh, 96368 can be uh, only allowed once per encounter, which is correct. However, if there are start and stop times at and the last three hours are uh, you allowed to charge the 96366 times two along with the 96368. And um, the 66 is actually an add-on code. So that's the first question that we're going to answer. Then the second question that uh, uh, was appended to that, it says, when you have someone that comes into the ER and they do a high V infusion, which is 96360, and they do a start and stop time, and then they transfer them to observation, which is not inpatient, it's just observation, and on the second day is given an infusion with a med, 96365, with a start and stop time, then they're wanting to know, you know, how do we code that? So we're going to look at that real quick. So the first thing you have to know, and I've got um, website addresses. If you're in the CCO club, you get these trans, you get these answer sheets. That's another perk. So you can go back and check those links. Uh, what is concurrent infusions? Because that's kind of what we're dealing with. But uh, whenever you have two drugs are given at the same time, or multiple infusions are provided through the same intravenous line, okay? So concurrent is the key word that we want to pay attention to because that's going to help you with the stop and start. Now, when you look in your CPT manuals, this is the area that you're going to. So this is the headings that you actually see in the manual. It's under the medicine section, and I was able to pull this from find a code. I love the way their encoder is set up. It is very conducive to education. But note, it's therapeutic, prophylactic, and diagnostic injections and infusion. But these codes that this person asked about excludes chemotherapy or high complex drugs. 
right? So there's another set of codes for those. So mainly what we're dealing with is uh, hydration and there's codes for hydration uh, that aren't these, uh, but we are um, giving them an IV, hooking them up to fluid for a specific reason other than just hydrating them. And then sometimes they'll they'll put a piggyback or, or attach another bag uh, with medication. Now, if it's something that they do less than 15 minutes, that's considered a push and that's a different code. So uh, with this intravenous uh, infusion, and it can be for any of these reasons, uh, the, the primary code that you're gonna use is the 96365, it's up to one hour. And then you notice here, these are all add-on codes. So an additional hour, you know, uh, then this is a, sub, a sequential infusion of a new drug or substance. So we're putting in a different med or fluid, and then they've got the concurrent infusion. Now, this other code, the 96368, same thing specify the drug or substance, okay, that's important, uh, for the concurrent infusions. But the guidelines tell you, report 96368 only once per date of service. So that's where the confusion comes in. They knew it was concurrent, but you can only code it once in uh, a date of service. Then they are saying, by the way, you could use these in conjunction with these other codes. Now, the 68 code, look up here, right? That's in concert with these, these other add-on codes. So this is the explanation of how I, I made this smaller because find a code had this in additional, but um, uh, most of us already know, you know, you place an IV line in the arm, usually blah, 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 all that other good stuff. Um, but um, Note that the physician provides periodic assessment and patient documentation of the response to the treatment and stuff. That's entailed in that code. And then it was bulleted out. So you've got your 96365 for up to one hour, and then these are those add-on codes. But remember, each additional hour, of the same infusion. So if it takes two hours to infuse something, and there's all kinds of protocols and reasons why it would take two hours, then you're gonna use those two codes, right? And then if it's gonna be a sequential infusion of a different drug, let's say, okay, as soon as we put in this, this drug, we're gonna turn around and you know give them potassium, a bag with potassium or something. And we're gonna do that for up to an hour. And then um, you've got the 96368, which is the uh, a different substance or drug at the same time as another drug is concurrent infusion. So the start and stop times can be counted just because they, in the, the question she said, well, they started and stopped and then they started it up again and stopped. Okay, you you can do that. So it, there's reasons why they would stop what they're putting in. So the stop, don't confuse start and stop with stopping means I'm not giving, we're not giving them anymore. And I think that's where that one question was getting them confused because they can still turn off the med, monitor them, you know, stop the the, uh, fluid and whatever content it is from going in and then start again and stop again. Where you have a hard stop is where you take the IV out and then you have to put an IV back in, right? So don't, don't get those two things confused of what you think a start and stop is and what the documentation of a start and stop is uh, because we don't always use the same verbiage. Now, I went ahead and um, footnoted where this comes from, but correct coding for hydration administration. This is exactly what you needed to be aware of. By the way, if you're just doing hydration, there's two codes that you can use for that. It's 96360 
and that's for 30 min 31 minutes to an hour, right? And then your add-on code is 96361. Okay, I just copy and paste that from this site. Uh, so hydration is different. Infusing for hydration is different than infusing for other substances. And uh, hydration has to state it's hydr for hydration. So we're infusing. What do we need to ask ourselves to make sure we can code this properly? What's the reason for the encounter? Why is the patient getting the infusion? Is it for hydration? Is it because they're low on potassium? Is it because they need uh, another chemical uh, because they're having a heart arrhythmia? There's a, you have to remember your heart is muscular, electrical, and chemical. So I have these horse pills that I take for potassium because I have to take HCTZ. If I don't take that potassium, it will, kind of feels like you're having a heart attack. Either that or you go to sleep and it's really hard to get up out of bed. It makes you very, you know, um, extremely weak and tired. And uh, I put myself in the hospital once because I missed like three days. And I took the HCTZ, but the potassium is two big giant horse pills. It's hard to remember to take them. And I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't wake up. So off to the ER I went. And sure enough, my potassium was so low that I got an infusion. And they made me take them, like six of those horse pills at once. So what's the reason for the encounter? If you don't have the, you have to have that documented. What's the name of the substance? What are we giving them? If we're giving them potassium or, you know, there's probably a J code, HixPix code, that is appended. And that's going to also uh, give you the reason, back up why you're having it, and then the time. It's always documented by the nurses. So the examples that were given from this website were so good that I wanted to, to show you. If a patient's seen for low potassium level and receives a one hour bolus of intravenous fluid mixed with potassium for treatment for the low potassium. So why are, what, what's the medical necessity? Why are they there? Low potassium. What's the Medicaid, you know, what are we giving them? The infusion of potassium at all for what? Low potassium. Then your CPT code would be the 96365 for the infusion. And you have to know, is it prophylactic or diagnostic purposes? So since the potassium bolus is targeted at for the treatment of low potassium, the infusion is therapeutic. Uh, it's not for hydration. Now, could they be dehydrated? Yeah, and they could even be diagnosed as hydration as well and low potassium. But they're giving them the IV for potassium, not for the, the dehydration. The uh, next one is an ER case. Uh, the patient is uh, febrile and dehydrated with a suspicious x-ray with a possible pneumonia. They receive uh, an IV hydration infusion for uh, over six hours of lactated ringers, which that's a pretty common hydration thing, as well as an, uh, an infusion of um, uh, vanicose, van oh dear, I can usually say this really well but I leave the N out, bacosomyosin over one hour. Okay, so how are we going to code this out? So what is the medical necessity? It's for hydration. So 96361 is what we're going to code, and the infusion of antibiotic is going to go uh, reported as the primary infusion uh, with one unit 96365. So six units of the hydration and then the um, uh, med the antibiotic 96365. That makes sense. So uh, again, not to really answer the the um, both parts of that question, we kind of need more information on this uh, ER and point of service and stuff like that. So uh, without knowing why was the patient getting the hydration, why were they set up for observation in the ER, was what was the reason for the start and stop? You know, we can't really answer that question properly, but that's the resources and the codes to go by to go forward. So hopefully you can do your own research off of that. We're gonna do this last um, poll, I think we should.
I think uh, we did you get value from tonight's CCO webinar? Why not? Let's try it because we're on such a good streak. Let's yeah. try it. And we'll make that bigger. And let us know in Facebook and YouTube as well. Did you get value from tonight's CCO Q&A webinar? You can put yes or no. Should we do this again? That kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, so Darman says, our office had a strict policy that the doctor must state the patient is dehydrated in order to pick up those codes, no matter how long they may have run it. Darman, that is, and that's another thing that a lot of times you don't have to go in brine on these infusions. There's a protocol in place that the provider has to follow and the coders know that, and that answers a lot of the questions for you. And that's why they did it, Darman. Thanks for mentioning that. And there's a question by Susan saying, has there, are there ever quiz questions in the last 30 minutes of these webinars? The extra questions. I'm not sure what that means. We take no, we don't, chat questions. Do you, do you know what she means we, by that? No, we, we don't do like quiz questions. Um, uh, but we used, or it wasn't live anymore, but we do ask questions after this. Should I bring okay. that other chat over or that other yeah, slide? Yeah, please renew it and okay, I'll try to. Okay, I got it up ready to go provide humor content so you're not all alone <laughs> without jennifer wait boyd and i've been working so long together i think we know how to feed off each other's energy i used to have hair before we started working together and that I, is I lost true. all of it afterwards you know? <laughs> my son oh, actually okay. hijacked one of my ipads and i think has been commenting in the youtube stream as me so that oh, has really me. yeah yeah <laughs> I have, I have, I have whatever. Anyway, okay, first one, prolonged care codes is the question. In what instances would you use prolonged care codes 99354 through 99359? Mm. So when, yeah, the, the, the key is that anytime something goes beyond the norm, you can use, uh, that's kind of a standard way to say it. Uh, so if a service is supposed to take X amount of time, let's say, you know, uh, uh, 20 minutes, this, it, and it ends up taking an hour and 30 minutes, then you can append these codes. So there is not any specific uh, that I could give you like a list, or I could probably think of some uh, uh, examples, but, you know, it's ultimately what it says. It's prolonged. And I can give you a little tip. What I would do is go in and hit 99354, um, <laughs> Google it, and you would be surprised. Put CPT 99354, and um, sometimes you will find really great articles by the payers, uh, like UHC, uh, Aetna. Uh, Cigna, Blue Cross Blue Shield on what their criteria is for prolonged services. And that is what you're going to go by. That's, they tend to set the protocol because, like I said, even though we code for statistical purposes, if they won't pay it <laughs> unless you follow the protocol, but they have some great free education out there and examples, uh, case scenarios. That's where I got those two last examples on the infusions was actually from a payer. It was brilliant stuff. So that's what I would do. Got it. Uh, next one, next one. How do you get bronchitis <laughs> while you're doing that? My wife's got bronchitis diagnosed today. How do you get bronchitis? It's usually an irritation. It, it can come from anything, but bronchitis usually results in um, uh, your immune system's either down or you've been exposed to something that's an irritant, um, change in weather, things like that. But bronchitis is it just an inflammation of the bronchus, which, you know, your esophagus is right here. You know, if you touch your Adam's apple and then past your Adam's apple, then it starts to branch out into the bronchus before it goes into the lung. And that's the area that um, gets uh, irritated. And that's what bronchitis is. Uh, you may or flu, may not need an antibiotic. 
this flu that's in not flu respiratory disease or not or whatever it is that's in China right now. Yeah. Are you familiar with that one? Usually I am, but I don't get um not only do I get no internet, I'm, I'm yet, I, I don't get the news. <laughs> Okay, got it. Okay, local so. But um, like when the avian flu and some of those others hit over there, and I did remember they said some other stuff. That's why they wear those masks all the time so they don't spread germs. But gotcha. um, uh, yeah, the, it, but just because you have bronchitis doesn't mean you have that. You could have bronchitis and something else because bronchitis is an irritation, inflammation of the bronchus, okay? It could be anything. I get uh, bronchitis when I have an asthma attack, uh, you know, so, uh, awesome. and then if you you might need it, they usually give you an antibiotic prophylactically, so you don't get I usually it. get my medical coding advice from Alicia before the webinar starts, but that was- Yeah, on because my, my children my think that I'm a doctor. Yeah, They're yeah. like, you're a doctor, right, mom? No, uh, no. <laughs> Next question, chronic conditions Can for ACP. Okay, can you use the patient's chronic conditions as the diagnosis for the ACP or should it always be uh, Z71.89? Uh, the, the depends. If the patient is being seen only for the counseling, that's the only reason they're there, then you would use the Z71.89. You can put their chronic conditions in there, so let's say they have diabetes with um, uh, gangrene and you know CKD and renal failure, and you know they're they're going to succumb. In other words, so they're making the decision. Yeah, you can, but the fact is, is just because they have all these diagnoses, the ACP having that done, um, really the Z code is is telling you the reason for the visit. So is the is the reason for the visit the Z71.89 alone? And then you can list all these diagnoses. Uh, the diagnosis diagnosis codes give medical decision making. So uh, think of it that way. Uh, can you pay, you know, pay that the patient patient has diabetes and then append that code? Yeah, but I think I would still use the Z71.89 let them know why, you know, they're doing it because they have diabetes and append this as the, the first diagnosis. Next question. I'll talk, I can talk. Left. Okay. Yeah, you could. Uh, oh, wait, I'm hitting the wrong one. thing, aren't I? Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I just I'm gonna do that. Number okay. four. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hit it again. Spinal, Spinal. decompression. <laughs> Give me a spinal question. When coding spinal decompression, uh, would it be correct to also code uh, 61783 for the robotic navigation? Uh, if the robotic navigation was done, yes. That's simple. Nice. Unless if, the only thing is if it's not included in 63047, you know, yeah, you go ahead. If the robotic, yeah, you want to code. Again, statistically, they want to know everything that was done. And if it's robotic navigation, absolutely, that needs to be appended. On there. Oh, we didn't do a, we didn't do a, a, a quit, a graduates. Somehow we yeah, missed we that. Not the graduates, the prize. I just oh. realized. Oh, you better go grab, you better go do that. I had them, I had them, I just have to make sure that they're here. Okay, you, you go on okay, to the next. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, guys. We've got, a lot of people are still here. Prepare for the assessment. Uh, CPC and currently cath lab coder. Good for you. With five years at facility, my question is, uh, whenever I apply for a remote coding position, I can't pass their assessment test. I know how to code, so what am I doing wrong and how, to, how, how should I pay, prepare for the assessment? The first thing I would ask you is, what area uh, um, are you applying for inpatient or outpatient? And then I would say, most of the time, the assessments uh, are, I would ask them where they're getting their assessment, okay? And usually the assessment is applied to where they want you to work, usually, but not always. Sometimes it's just an old uh, assessment that they've had for a long time. But the key thing in almost all assessments is, do you know how to append modifiers? Do you... Uh, know how to do uh, sequencing. 
So make sure your sequencing is correct. Also, ask them, can I find out, you know, what I need to improve in for with the assessment? They're, they're probably not going to give you the assessment, you know, to look at, but they could say, yeah, you, you, it seems like you need to do more study and modifiers, or you need a little more help in ENM, or you need um, uh, a little help with, you know, this particular thing. So uh, again, cath lab coder, you're, you're a niche, great area. However, you probably don't get a lot in ENM and uh, the modifier usage that's general. And that's, that's what I would focus on. Yeah. Uh, let's see, last one. Social worker, can a social worker bill 907, hmm, 91 with that uh, 96127 and which modifier would be used? Uh, you know what? I don't know. I have to go look at the code. I don't have that memorized. Uh, I kind of think I know what it is, but I wouldn't be able to tell you without looking at the code. So that would take more research. But because it's such a great question, uh, I can put that in the CCO club and you can go in there and look at it. If you're not a member of the CCO club, we'll uh, let us know. We'll put it in one of our webinars. So I'll be more than happy to, to check on that. I just, and I can't bring up my encoder. The, the inter my internet won't handle me doing that and you still being able to see this uh, loveliness here. I'd have to turn my sound off and all that other stuff. So I have to follow up. Do you still have the slide deck open from the regular one or do you have to reload it? Um, I still have it open. Go to a couple slides more down. Go two more, I think. Okay. And we'll announce the winner here. Because she is on, Sabrine Washington. One more is a winner of yeah. one of these choices, Sabrine Washington, either a vi Blitz video package or a one year of CCO Club Basic or a one hour session with Alicia or Jennifer, one of the CCO team, whoever you want to yep. you know, get on their calendar and talk about stuff. So so if you're getting ready to, to test for a credential, get one of the Blitzes. If you, the best value is a one year of the CCO Club, but, um, I, I don't mind talking to you for an hour. There you I go. I don't know why you'd want to. <laughs> the, handout, the handout also is uh, I uploaded it to the to the, your GoToWebinar control panel for those of us in GoToWebinar. And um, the answer sheets, somebody asked how do you get the answer sheets? Well, you have to become a member of the CCO club in order to get the answer sheets. This is the way that we do things now because of our of the way that we do things. Not that way. Yep. They remember. got lots of perks, Club. those CCO Club people. Take us home. Facebook, okay. we're always on Facebook every Guys. day. CCO.us yep. on Facebook. And here's all those references. And you know what? We we have so many people tell us they found us on YouTube. So we appreciate you sharing the videos. If it, you found it helpful on medical coding search, uh, uh, right Next here slide. is our link for YouTube. And then you can... Um, you passed it. Uh, shared you on LinkedIn YouTube. too. You passed oh, it too. I just somehow. maybe I hit it. Mm, it's not there. I Come went back, back forward one. Go uh, back to. There it is. There it is. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to yell. It's at updated you. thumbnail. So uh, when I do that, then I want to see. Yeah. So again, you know, almost fourteen hundred videos there, and you know, almost four million views, but. Uh, Boyd's always taken segments, and then we stream live on YouTube, Facebook, uh, and LinkedIn. Um, but, hey, if you haven't found us on LinkedIn, go find us, because we're really promoting LinkedIn now. They live stream and meeting some great people out there, sharing some great stuff. So. Um, yeah, I was going to say Bertrand had a... Um... Bertrand had a live with CCO, right? That was a live with CCO, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. No. Yes, and no, he, he, it was the that was a, line, But I was yeah. thinking about remote coding, and I thought that would be a great video to also watch as a part of a, oh, a follow-up. In fact, he made a post, I saw it today, about his experience working with us and doing that, and how many people were engaged, uh, as well as some other stuff, and he was going to, uh, and he was having another interview with another organization that, so great stuff, recruiter. Um, yeah, so we, that we're gonna you, do if you look in, in YouTube under CCO Live, Live with CCO, um, and look for, what was it called? What do we call it again? Uh, um, ask a Recruiter. 
yeah, ask a recruiter and they'll they'll pop it up. Okay. We did so, uh, with Rick. We did ask an auditor, and um, we're gonna do some other things here in the future. Yep. Very cool. Yay! We did it. Yeah. Sabrine, just uh, go to help desk at cco.us and you can get your prize. Yeah. Help desk at cco.us. Email. Congratulations. Help desk at cco.us. Okay, great. So that's it for us, everybody. And thank you, Alicia, for staying with us the whole time. And as always, being the captain of our ship. Yeah. I am your first mate. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for I'm waiting for something. Oh, oh. <laughs> sounds good. I must be tired, yeah. Okay. I am tired. <laughs> I'll let you guys go. Hopefully it doesn't show. <laughs> I will sign off. Thanks everybody for being with us tonight. Congratulations to everyone for uh, being with us and Miss Washington, I hope to see you around here. Okay. Yeah, I, I, enjoy, I, I saw several names uh, that I recognize and we appreciate that, that you guys come again and again and support us. Share with your friends. Bye.